The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss does companion planting really work, as well as mulch for your garden and ornamentals. Plus, host of PBS's own Growing a Greener World, Joe Lample will be with here, with us here, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. I'm happy that you've tuned into the program. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, as well as preserving what you grow and make your grass look a little bit greener. Thank you for tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com at the Season 7 tab at the top of the page in uh, radio app, in-studio video replay, podcast replay, however you're capturing the program. Thank you very much. You want to be part of the program that you're tuning into, you can certainly do that by giving us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Toll free, coast to coast. If you're not the phone type, send us an email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And send us your question or just let us know where you're listening to us at in the world. Well, how effective is companion planting, and does it work, Holly? Uh, this is a whole topic. Oh, um, yeah, it's a whole topic, and from a scientific standpoint, where you see these charts on Pinterest or social media, and it's like, if you plant basil next to your tomatoes, they'll grow nice and strong. From that scientific standpoint, companion planting does not is not a thing. Or if you plant this next to that, it will make that sweeter because this is planted next to that. Right. Yep. And, um, yeah. So for example, one of the, I don't know if people know this anymore or not, but one of the oldest things, um, and companion planting myths, I guess, is with three sisters. So three sisters is when you plant corn, beans, like, um, Pole beans. Pole beans and squash together. And you do this because the the scientific part of it was supposedly the beans were feeding nitrogen into the soil to feed the corn. And that is not true. The corn is such a heavy feeder of nitrogen and other nutrients in the soil that the beans could never utilize or provide enough nitrogen for said corn. What the bean, what the corn is doing for the beans is creating a place for the beans to grow up. But yes, that's true, and that's a that is a uh, method of companion planting, intercropping too, intercropping. Yep, and that's like the new companion planting. And the squash, whether it's vine or uh, like zucchini or whatever, is grown around the the corn in order to shade the ground to reduce soil evaporation. So that is that that is a, they're all benefiting one another, but there's no the, the it's the the theory has gotten all discombobulated over the years that this is what it's doing and this is the great way to doing it. And corn you got to grow in a block and to order for it to pollinate correctly. Now we've never done the three sisters. Well, we did it once and it wasn't that successful. But you want to make sure the corn can pollinate, and corn can pollinate up to, I think it's a thousand feet. You know, uh, we didn't plant the three seeds in one hole. Maybe correct. that's where we went wrong. It, well, yeah, but <laughs> that that's what they want. They, you, you, the Native Americans, this is where this has come from. The Native Americans dug a hole, put a fish in there, filled it with the seeds, and let it grow, and everything was magical well, in history. In- I mean, we don't know. Corn has changed so much. Corn used and, to be a grass back yeah. in medieval times. And so, we've, gene- we've, what is it, uh, botanist or yeah. we've altered it to the yeah. point where it doesn't exist in nature. Engineered it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not genetic modification. It's just how it's changed. Yes. But um, yeah, so we don't know what kind of corn slash bean slash squash they were growing. I'm assuming the squash is probably the same squash we all have now to this day. 
but as far as the corn and the beans we don't know but um it was it's just funny because like my friend was at a gardening help thing for their HOA and whoever was in charge of it told them to put a whole egg into the soil when they planted the tomato right a whole egg for not break it up not break it up just put the whole egg well that so, yeah the, there's not an there the calcium in which is in an egg yes there's calcium and yes if broke down it will feed the soil but it takes up to 18 months to do that even if you crush it up in your hand not even just putting the egg under the the tomato Right. No, this was a whole oh, entire whole egg. egg. Yeah. I think that cells might start to stink in the next couple Well, of days. it's not going to benefit anything. No, it's not. But anyway, okay. So back That's to- That's a garden myth for another day. Back to sister crops, or back to companion planting. Yes. So there are sister crops, which we touched on, um, as you had called, it's called intercropping, uh-huh. like is the, the uh, official term, but that might confuse people. So sister crops is basically- um, things like planting radishes next to tomatoes if you are um, or planting the tomatoes next to the radishes because the radishes will be done by the time right. the tomatoes are grown. Planting a very quick growing crop in amongst slower growing crops. You plant your radishes, you know where the radishes are at, you, you plant your tomatoes in between the radish rows. You leave a wide enough space in order to plant your tomatoes, and then you harvest the tomatoes, and then you have a walking path to harvest your, to, your, your radishes. Then you have a walking path to harvest your tomatoes when the time comes. So, and, and companion planting, it is, there is a scientific proof of we plant one plant next to another plant in order to help that. Example, you plant radishes next to spinach, so the leaf miners, if you have an infestation of leaf miners, which creates um, cavities or tunnels between the layers of leaf, and that's that's the white dead areas in the leaf, you plant your radishes next to your spinach, so the leaf miners attack the radish leaves, but not the spinach leaves, and both plants are able to be harvested for the purpose of the intended reason of growing them, the leafy greens for the spinach, the bulb for the radishes. Right. So that is the, um, I guess, the the, the companion planting. Well, also, it, um, it can be a trap plant. Trap plant, yep. trap plant. That's, That's another a, term here. Yeah. So the trap plant is also known as a decoy plant, a sacrificial plant, um, it's they have a few different names, but again, with the leaf miners, it's to distract the leaf miners away from the spinach. For that example, another um, example would be you plant rosemary or basil around your zucchini plant to for the slugs no, to diffuse and confuse the squash vine borer. Okay, moth. So there, are, yeah, people also do that for the slugs because okay. they like the rosemary. I think, okay, if I remember correctly. And caterpillars sometimes too. They like the rosemary. They like the stocky, the stocky plants. So okay. another one is um, chervil. Slugs like chervil. So if you put near a lettuce crop, they won't get to your lettuce. And then, okay, another. So we have we have more examples, but sometimes you'll get your own trap plant that just happens from a plant that you didn't mean to be a trap plant. Or a sacrificial plant, whatever you want to call it. Like that one year we had giant, those aphids. That, what was that? Giant lamb's quarters. Yeah, yeah. It's a edible plant that Native Americans would use as a substitute for spinach. At least that's what it, the, the, the story has been told. But the aphids attacked the tall lamb's quarter, which was not removed because we just never got to it. So we left it alone and they attacked that instead of the other plants in which we were growing to harvest. So... You want to maybe leave a few weeds in the garden and make sure they don't go to seed and, and cut the seed head off, but that would be a way of deterring or, or attracting insects. There should be a good balance. We talked to Doug Oster a couple of weeks ago about the balance of good and bad bugs in the garden. If you missed that, you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com or go to our parent website, uh, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, and search for the Season 7 tab and, and find it there. Um, you know, 
so there are things, there are plants that we have from a horticultural standpoint have found that if we plant plant A next to plant C, it, they both can be harvested for their intended purposes, but they both are benefiting each other by luring something away from one or preventing the attack of something on both of them. Right. So that's that's essentially what the um, trap plant, sacrificial plant is. And it, I guess the biggest thing is, is that if you see a chart online or whatever, if it makes sense, do it. If it makes sense for you, sometimes don't just look at one. We don't don't just look at one. But sometimes you might think, okay, if I do this, it's really going to be out of my way. This is going to be an extra step, and I just don't know if I have the time or patience or whatever to do it. Then don't do it. I mean, if you have the time to figure that all out, plan your garden. Do the sacrificial plants, do the intercropping, whatever you should. But if you're like, you know what, this for me, this is if I've done it this way, I'm not even putting any thought into this and it's effective. It's what I have time for. Then do that, too. Well, the problem is you can look at companion planting charts online and you can look at 37 of them and there's 33 that's different. And they're, they're all different combinations. And by a scientific standpoint, some of the combinations do not... Four plus four doesn't always equal eight, if you know what I mean. Right. But you know what does make sense? What always equals eight? Walton's Incorporated and what they have available for all of us in our kitchens and if you are a butcher. I think that they are definitely, they, they make a lot of sense. So we are brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's. Listen, we know you care about where your food comes from. You can and preserve it at Walton's, Inc. You can get all the equipment seasoning supplies to make sausage jerky and any other meat product your way you can also go to meatgistics.com an informational site to help you make the best finished product there are over fifteen thousand users to help give their opinion on guidance on meat processing issues and they just have decades of experience in meat processing industry and they want you to have that experience or have that trusted knowledge. source yep and they have everything but the meat they have all sorts of seasoning Meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers to go from animal to edible. Walton's everything but the meat. If you use code GROW50, GROW50, you save 10% off your orders of $50 or more at waltonsinc.com. Change your backyard barbecue and impress people with the seasonings and tools that they have. Hang out with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about mulches for ornamental and edible. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products that last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. Their wool socks come from Rocky Mountain source materials, are soft and comfortable, keep your feet warm and dry, and come with a lifetime guarantee. Even for the most sensitive toes, these socks are made for everyone. High-quality wool socks make a huge difference for happy feet. They fit in with all the many things you do from around the house to the outdoors and beyond. They are comfortable and long-lasting. These socks are great for gardening because they keep your feet so comfortable no matter the conditions outside. It's hard to overstate how amazing these feel to have warm, dry feet as you work in your garden. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at grip6.com. Use coupon code RADIO15 to save 15% off your order at grip6.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy to install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature 
in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mart.com to shop for all your needs. Ah, spring, the season of renewal, an unexpected house guest, none the worse perhaps than ants. And I'm not talking about great Aunt Mabel. When you need to get rid of ants fast, you need rescue ant baits. Rescue ant baits are pre-baited, child-resistant, and ready to use right out of the box. No sticky liquid, no mess. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular Rescue Fly and Yellow Jacket Traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. Dripping Springs Oyas clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas, O-L-L-A-S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks. Rise Gardens, Grip Six, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Happy you are with us today. Farm Defense Holly. A source in which can protect you while you are working outdoors. Yeah, farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer's Sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicking material with UBF protection factor of 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. Well, mulch, Holly, Holly. Mulch is a key to gardening. It's not a necessity, but it certainly is a an added tool in order to help your garden grow better. The benefit or the purpose of mulch is to, one, hold moisture into the ground, two, suppress the weeds, and it, in the early season, keep the soil warmer, and in the hot season, keep the soil cooler. A proper amount of mulch can reduce the soil temperatures to, from a, as minimal as three to five degrees, which can make a tremendous difference on the type of plants you're growing and keeping those roots cool and moist while they're trying to produce. Absolutely. So there is options for edibles and options for decorative. So what you put around your decor- decorative plants that you won't be eating you may not want to put around your edibles, but I think anything you put around your edibles, you could put around Correct. your decorative plants. So they're not interchangeable, but they halfway. are. Halfway. Halfway. So the first one I think that a lot of people might overlook is straw. Straw is the stalk of the grain or stalk of the grain plant, whether it's oat straw, barley straw, um, uh, wheat straw. You can utilize that. There is concern about organic straw versus inorganic straw. We've always just got straw from either found it on the side of the road after um, the Halloween season and or purchased straw from the garden center and utilized it either for straw bale gardening and or mulch around the plants and never have had a problem with any type of uh, residue if something was to have been sprayed on that straw. You can do your research and ask your questions, but we have not found any issue in when, what we have used. Wood chips is another form of mulch. Wood chips is uh, more utilized or we would recommend to be utilized around perennial beds, berry beds, asparagus beds, something in which you're not going to go in and till the soil as the wood chips breaking down can take nitrogen out of the soil, which is one of the key elements for plant development, making the plants green. So you would want to utilize that, and that can be something that can be used pretty much in any bed, ornamental or edible. Use it around trees, fruit trees, um, 
nut trees, anything like that, in order to hold the weeds down. Now, it doesn't mean it's 100% going to eliminate the weeds. It's not a chemical, but any type of mulch can greatly reduce the amount of weeds that come up. So wood chips is another source of uh, mulch in which you can use. You can get uh, find free wood chips. You can find... A, the, the wood shipping power people and say, hey, you know, here's a couple of dollars. Would you bring it over the driveway? You can mulch your own with specific mulching tools if you have a lot of limbs. So a couple of ways of going about doing that. Absolutely. So you can use the wood chips for that. So um, the leaves, now this is something that you're not going to necessarily have in the spring. It's something that you need to think about in the fall is to collect your leaves and then utilize them for your mulch. And the nice thing about leaves is that they are of abundance, typically. And then you can also um, bag them and save them for the spring if you want to. They do break down quite quickly, um, but they do feed the soil, which is nice. And they make really good mulch. Yes. And pine needles is another means of mulch. Pine needles can be found pretty much year round. If you are harvesting, it's called pine straw in some areas. If you're going to take the pine needles from the around the pine tree, you don't want to go all the way down to the soil level. You want to leave a little bit of protection as if you've got pine trees and they're over, they're casting over the grass area, you can rake all those up and utilize them. You can take some from around the base of the tree. Pine needles, yes, are acidic at 3.5 on the pH scale. Well, they are on the tree putting them in the garden will take a very long time to break down and by the time they break down they neutralize to a 7.0 so you're not going to and we see this over and over again on any uh, and many social media uh, platforms on uh, videos here's what you need to do to make your soil acidic add pine needles pine needles do not make your soil acidic there's a garden myth yeah it's a garden myth yes yeah so uh, they don't make your soil acidic. if you're going to use them for composting you only want to use 10 per per the volume of your compost because they will take a long time to break down. Cardboard is another one in which you can utilize mulch. Pine needles. Some oh, yes, people say up. that the slugs don't like going over them. I don't know how true that is, but it is a possibility. Cardboard. So cardboard might not be a popular mulch or an aesthetically pleasing mulch or anything. We, we know there's chemicals in the glue. Yeah. We're aware of that. Right. But um, you might you might have a lot of cardboard and you might not care that it's not aesthetically pleasing and if it stops the weeds from coming through then use it yeah if you don't want to use it around the plants you can use it in the walk paths and then put pine straw or leaves or or straw on top of that and you know type of thing um you can do that cocoa mulch holly this is the mulch that is the chocolate smelling stuff isn't it so this is more now cocoa mulch is definitely for decorative um plants uh -huh. I don't think you'd use that around edibles. I've never heard of anybody using that around right. edibles. Yeah. Now, if you do have a dog, you do not want to do the cocoa mulch unless it's in an area that they wouldn't have access to because dogs want to eat the cocoa mulch, lick it, whatever, and chocolate is very poisonous to dogs, so you want to keep that in mind. Rubber tires or the kind of the, the mulch in which uh, you see around playgrounds. I don't know of many people... Um, are going to utilize that in their home garden, but that is something that people may choose to use. Uh, I would shy away from that. One, because it can retain heat. And then two, it doesn't look that good to me. It's a playground material. Not I was a, just thinking that if you put the rubber tire, whatever, chips. whatever chips, yeah, it's going to look like a playground because that's what they put on the, the pads of the playground. I mean, they, it's not the chips, but it would be kind of playground-esque. Right. And I could, I don't know, I just feel like it would smell when it's hot out because mm -hmm. of the sun baking it. Like, it would smell like a playground. Like like asphalt. Yeah, like asphalt, but just uh, the rubber the rubber tire chips. Uh, pine I chip. To, I oh, wanted, go ahead. Yes. I wanted to go back to cocoa mulch. Yes. So if you do decide to use cocoa mulch, know that it's very dusty. Uh-huh. And when you spread it, um, you get that dust on you, especially if you're wearing sunscreen or it's a, a humid day it will stick to your skin and our our neighbor is a he's a flower gardener uh, slash like kind of landscape or whatever and when I was getting my my bachelor's degree a few years ago I worked for him one summer and I remember I was spreading cocoa mulch and I went to the store afterwards and I had 
cocoa mulch <laughs> up and dust up and down my arms. Oh. And this lady, this older lady, was like, "You smell like chocolate." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, it's this mulch." What's the mulch? Is that's what's all over your arms? And I was like, "Yeah." And so it breaks down slowly too. It does break down. It slowly. will mold. Oh yeah, yeah, it will mold. Yeah, it will mold because of the context, uh, the the way it's made. Uh, it, it will cause mold and you make, so make cause sure issues you, there. You might want to shower, hose off, or whatever. Before, well, I mean, just if you apply it and mold, you can't really shower it off. I mean, you spray no, it down. I mean, like if you apply it and then it's stuck to your skin. Right. You go to the store. You might have questions. Synthetics. Synthetics. So, I think. So, did we talk about pine chips? No. We, no, we have not talked about pine chips. Go ahead, pine chips. So, pine chips are basically like wood chips, and they, people use them in their in their uh, decorative garden. Shredded paper is another form of mulch. Uh, you, we've all get, we still get junk mail, even though we're paperless. Uh, you can shred that and put that around your plants, your edible plants. The ink is soy based, so it's not toxic. And that is a very popular video on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that through our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable And we utilize mulch. You can put it around your onions, you can put it around, you know, just enough to protect and barricade the sun from hitting the soil. And people will think, oh, it's just going to blow around. We've not had that problem. If you had that problem, missed it with water once you put it down. Other people will take layers of newspaper. Uh, if you're not familiar what a newspaper is, uh, Google image that. Uh, because I don't know if there's very many newspapers around anymore. You know, that's that's not funny because that's it's like it's something that is dying out. Right. And there's I was also you know talking to some friends about how none of us read magazines. Uh huh. And so many people used to read magazines. It's not really a thing anymore. I wouldn't use a shredded paper that has gloss on them no. because it's got a it's that's basically a, a plastic coating on it. Uh, but but the newspapers you can lay down and and put a couple of barriers of that down and then put straw or one of these uh, items in which we talked about and kind of put a couple of layers of protection uh, over the soil or put them around your plants type of thing. So something to um, think about and mulch synthetic or natural. I would always lean towards we would always lean towards natural mulch, whether you're ornamental or um, edible. So and mulch not only the, the flowers and roses and tomatoes and and squashes, you, you can do this around shrubs. Uh, gravel is another mulch. Uh, pea gravel or larger decorative stone is another form of mulch, and you can do that around trees. Your your trees as well. So keep that in mind. Think about mulch. It's a very f useful and important tool in which we all can utilize in the garden. If you, if you want to control beetles and grub invaders without affecting the rest of the ecosystem in your yard, then Grub Gone and Beetle Gone are the solution. Phylum's Grub Gone and Beetle Gone target a wide range of invasive and destructive beetles, weevils, borers, and without harming the non-target such as bees, ladybugs, butterflies, earthworms, or other beneficial insects. You can purchase these products locally in Massachusetts at Words Nurseries. McHugh Garden Center and Hyannis Country Garden in Connecticut at Van Williams Garden Center in Maine at Salisbury Organics in New York at Fadigan's Nursery and in Ohio at Berlin Seeds. Phylum Bioproducts target the pest, not the rest. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. If you want to carry it in your store, you can get a hold of them at phylum bioproducts.com or contact us here at the show at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and we will get you hooked up with them. Hang out with us when we come back. Host of PBS's own Growing a Greener World, Joe Lampo will be with us. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again over apply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Fleet Farms Garden Center is now open. Stop in to check out their selection of nursery quality plants available at low prices. All of their plants are grown in the Midwest and their vegetables are incesticide free. Choose from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and more. Plus, take care of your lawn with grass seed fertilizers, lawnmowers, and string trimmers. Get everything you need to keep your yard looking great at Fleet Farm, your lawn and garden headquarters. Tree hugger sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. 
are sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. Treehuggersprinklers.com Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code radio 23 to save 15 percent off your order at rootmaker.com chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long whether your garden is big or small chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing weed and pest control watering and seeding you can find chapin products at your local hardware store big box retailer you may visit them also online at chapinmfg.com to learn more and buy online Blue Ribbon Organics providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloomingeasyplants.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua Dash Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the wisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Joe Lampo will be with us. But first, a message from our good friends at Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or thousands of miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb knowledge required. Gardening makes gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to go from seed to harvest. Um, from healthy and to the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information, get your Rise Garden. Visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Joel Lample is not only an experienced gardener, but an author, blogger, podcaster, and host of the well-known PBS show, Growing a Greener World. Welcome to the program, Joe. Hey, Holly. Hey, Joey. It's good to be back. Well, we're always happy when you take time out of your obviously very busy schedule to uh, join us on the program and and enlighten your knowledge on all of us and our listeners. And we thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. So let, let's ask, I'm going to ask the obvious question for people who watch the program and see your raised beds and then they're like, oh, uh, and then they look in their backyard. How do you get enough compost for your raised beds? How do you supplement that or where, where do you get that? And how do you keep your soil productive and fed year after year once you've obtained that compost? Yep. I, I make a lot of compost. And so uh, I've got three, three bin pallet system. So basically nine bays where I'm always making compost and it's either fresh compost, it's in process or it's finished. So I've always got a finished source somewhere in that nine bin system. And that's what I use to supplement my raised beds every year. And I do it twice a year. I just top dress it one inch of compost, finished compost at the beginning of the summer crop going in so basically after i pull my cool season crops out which i can sometimes 
over winter and get an early spring crop. But before I plant my summer crops, I'm I'm top dressing. And then I do it again in August when I'm pulling out some of my warm season stuff to make room for my cool season. When I have that blank slate in between, I'm top dressing again. And, and that's it. I let the microbes and the soil food web bring everything down in. And I don't overdo it because once you get your beds good and filled with organic material, you don't, you know, you just need to top dress it. You don't, a little bit goes a long way, I guess, is the moral of the story. Now, in order to fill those beds, did you didn't make all that compost. You had to bring some of that in, didn't you, like many of us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. That was a lot of compost initially. So I had to, I had to find a good source for that. And that's the hard part, you know, but fortunately I was able to do it. But, you know, you just got to do your homework before you make that kind of investment of money and space in your garden beds for questionable compost. You need to make sure you're getting good stuff before it's delivered. And, and, and like many things in life, you pay for what you get. If it's expensive, there's probably a reason why it's expensive. And if yes. it's El Cheapo, there's probably a reason why it's El Cheapo. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, 100% every time. Now, you're in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Are you able to grow virtually year-round, or, or you is there a, a stopping point for you? Uh, I'm, I'm able to grow year-round with the, the more hardy, cool-season crops, but I can get well past our, our first frost date of the fall with pretty much all my brassicas because, you know, they're loving the frost anyway. And um, many of them will go, you know, until they start bolting in the spring. Okay. So if I haven't harvested them yet, like kale is a good example, you know, it, it just goes and spinach is another one. And now they're all going to seed, but I ha I never pulled them out and I've been harvesting nonstop. So that's amazing. That is amazing. So what is a major plant disease that you have dealt with frequently or just had dealt with once and you just have really good handle on it and how did you get rid of it or control it? Well, I'll tell you one that's a, Maybe, I mean, uh, to me, all the diseases are pretty challenging because they're very persistent and they're everywhere and they come in from the air or in the soil. But one that I struggle with every year is fusarium wilt, which is a soil borne disease that shows up initially with yellow coloration on one side of the branch or one side of the plant, like tomatoes, for example. That's a very susceptible plant to it. And as a soil borne disease, it's really the only way that you can deal with it because there is no consumer grade solution for it. You have to rotate your crops. And the, and in the equivalent in the north where you guys are would be like verticillium wilt. So both of these are soil borne diseases. They show up with yellow coloration on the foliage. Verticillium works its way from the bottom up across the plant. Fusarium, like I have, kind of is one sided with the yellow and then it kind of makes its way across the plant. But they pretty much act the same. And the only way that you can really work through it is to rotate your crops from the same family out of that soil environment for at least three years up to 10. But, you know, the, the realistic way for a homeowner is to maybe three to five years not plant back in that same spot. And the way that I deal with that is I use grow bags and I just – I don't even plant in other beds because all my beds have been planted with something in the tomato family uh, pretty much every year. So the only way I get away from it and rotate and let those pathogens starve out is to find some place else to plant anything in the in the solanaceae family. So the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes. Don't go back in that bed for three to five years. And I use grow bags as my alternative place to plant. Boy, that's got to be tough. You see that bed empty, you're like, man, I should plant there, but you know you can't. I can't plant tomatoes back there or yeah. peppers, that's for sure. I try to find something that's not in the family and make use of it, but I can't go back with those, those solanaceous crops. Now, you are obviously someone who is able to be in the garden more frequently than the average person. For people who are not able to be in that in their garden as frequently as, as they would like, what are some of your best weeding control tips if you can only get in the garden a couple hours a week or maybe every other week? Mulch. The, my single answer, mulch. Um, two inches of mulch, like I have it in my garden pathways between my beds, a uh, hardwood, un, un, untreated, non-dyed, natural hardwood mulch. And, um, you know, I mean, you could use Arbor's wood chips for free. But whatever you use, if you can block the sunlight to the soil surface, you're going to reduce significantly 
the number of weed seeds that are going to germinate there. Now they're still going to, you're still going to have weeds because they're going to wash in from runoff. And, you know, if your garden's downhill from someplace that wash out into your garden is going to bring with it weed seeds and they're going to germinate even in the mulch, but they'll be easier to pull out. But if you can deny sunlight to the soil surface and mulch is the easiest way to do that. And as it breaks down, it improves your soil. Even when you have weeds, they're easier to pull. So this part two of it is when you see weeds, take a few minutes a week uh, and just pull out the ones you see. I mean, it only takes a few minutes and then you stay ahead of it. The worst thing is when you start getting overwhelmed because you haven't taken the time to pull out the ones that pop up. And eventually that catches up with you. And then it becomes a daunting eyesore task that you've got to deal with it. They're not going away. You've got to get them out of there and the mulch will help with that. So mulching and pulling. Right. And, and you don't use chemicals. We don't use chemicals, but about 10 years ago, there was a very popular garden show. It's no longer on the air. And he was talking about how he accidentally sprayed the one weed killing chemical in the garden. And it was the best thing he ever did. And he would encourage people to do that. Just don't get it around your edible plants. You can just, you don't have to weed anymore. He's not on the air anymore, and that's what the problem is for people like you and us who are trying to get the right information out. This stuff is stuck in their head from these people who are just trying to get whatever you want, you know, add, you know, clicks and, and subscribers and listeners. We're trying to tell the real thing, and they're they're just saying whatever they need to say in order to get people to listen. Yeah, and that's very bad advice because in addition to just the fact that it's bad stuff, the drift from it, mm-hmm. it will get on those plants, and it only takes – you know, a billionth of a particle or whatever. It's just very minute and it can really do damage if not kill your plants. And so, you're breathing it in too. Correct. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And if it doesn't get to your plants, it might get to your neighbor's plants and that's not good either. Yeah. 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 Your uh, newest book came out last fall, the ve- the vegetable gardening book, Your Complete Guide to Growing an Edible Organic Garden from Seed to Harvest. What is something in that book that would encourage our encourage our listeners to pick up a copy, whether they are a newer gardener or more experienced gardener, anywhere along the line? Yeah. Okay. So let's just say they're an experienced gardener. I love talking to gardeners at all levels because I feel like we all have something to share and there's always more to learn and you're not going to know it all and I'm not going to know it all, but I'm always learning and it's often coming from other people, even though I do this for a living and I've been doing it for three decades plus, I'm always learning. So for the, for, for me or the experienced person, my book is probably potentially new information to them, but for the newer gardener, imagine what, just imagine if you could have somebody as a mentor or a guide in your garden, that's kind of looking over your shoulder and talking to you like a friend. And the two of you are in the garden one-on-one learning and gardening together. Well, I wrote this book with that in mind so that somebody reading that book would feel like, God, I feel like Joe's talking to me and I feel like we're kind of in the garden together. And so it's casual, it's informal, but it's very informative. It's all science-based. It's not too heady. So it's easy to comprehend. And yet the information you need to know is there. And I, and I say it this way, I am a big believer in teaching you the why do behind the how to. So it's okay. It's good to know how to do something, but I think it's more important to know why you need to do the steps to make that happen so that you can apply that information to other things. You know, it's not just following a recipe. It's chefing your way through the meal. You know, it's, it's because you, you've got this knowledge of what works and what doesn't and, and why it works or why it doesn't that you can apply without feeling like you can only follow a, a series of predetermined steps. And so that's what my book was intended to feel like all the way through. And it covers start to finish soup to nuts, taking you through the entire process of how to set up a garden, lay it out, think about placement of your plants, the soil, the mulch, the the top 40 plants that you probably are going to grow if you're growing a vegetable garden between warm and cool season crops and how to grow each of those step by step. So there's a lot there. And, uh, you know, I could fit in as much as I could in the, in the pages that they allowed me to have to write the book. So it's packed with information. Fantastic. And I think in this age of technology, 
you can get information that's like this is how you do xyz but not everybody yeah. explains the the why why do you no. do xyz and i think no. that there's a lack of that with all the technology and information that we have so it's yeah. really important absolutely yes yeah if you want to be serious about improving your craft or your skill you, you just got to know more than just the steps. I mean, that's just a recipe card. You need to know the reasoning behind it, and that's how you get better. I couldn't agree more. So we are talking with Joe Lampo, gardener, author, blogger, podcaster, and host of the well-known PBS show, Growing a Greener World. There are so many garden tools out there. What are some, What are the main ones every gardener should have, and what are the ones that they should be avoiding? I'm thinking about what I would walk out in my garden with almost every time. And it would be my, my sheath that holds my pruners and my soil knife. So those are two things right there. And, and I almost feel naked walking out without them. I mean, I, I have them by my door coming in and out towards the garden. And I grab those every time, put them on my hip. And then I'm always reaching for them, whether it's, you know, pruning a branch or or using my soil knife to dig a hole to plant something or maybe scrape out some weeds or, you know, dig something out of the lawn or cut some twine. I mean, gosh, there's a million things I do with just those two tools. And then one more that I, every time I'm in the garden, I, I have, you know, those rubber, they used to be called tub trucks, but now they're called gorilla tubs. Yes. They're, they're rubberish handled, strong, nice colors come in different sizes big, large pails, rubber pails, those things. I, I just love them. I I have, I probably have 12 of them scattered around and for weeding, for hauling in mulch, for, um, carrying loads of organic matter into your beds, for moving compost out of your bin into the beds, for filling it with like, for me, a quick way to fertilize my garden beds with my fish emulsion is to fill up one of those big tub trucks with the water and the dilution and then take my watering can and plunge it into the the big tub and it's instantly filled and then i can go around the garden and you know apply it to my plants and come back and refill it you know five or six times before i have to make up another big batch versus individually you know doing your one gallon watering can or something like that every time you have to refill it that's that's way more time than just doing it one time in a big tub truck for like five or six rounds. So those three things are, I think things that every gardener should have, no matter how long they've been gardening or how new they are. Those are things you can't go wrong with. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us. How can people, where should people go to find your books? Where should people go to find the show and and what you're offering? Yeah, I think JoeGardner.com is the single one place that probably will get you everywhere else and show you all the things that I'm doing with the podcast and the Online Guardian Academy and uh, the videos and, you know, whatever I have going on. It's probably on the website somewhere. There's a link for it from there. And Growing a Green World, check your local PBS station for times and availability in your market. Yep. We appreciate the time, Joe, and the information you've shared with us. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Goodbye, biting bugs and plant invaders. No More Bugs by Naturally Green Products is your answer. A product pioneered by the USDA in 14 years in business, No More Bugs has been a favorite by consumers across the country. More than a repellent, it is safe for you, your plants, pets, and home. Visit nomorebugs.net. Free shipping on orders over $50. Use code freeship for me Do you know that overwatering and underwatering are the top causes of plant death? Tree Dipper solves both those problems by absorbing excess water and releasing it back when the soil dries. Use code GARDEN15 to save 15% on TreeDiaper.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. 
Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. Make watering easy. Dripworks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Listen, at Furlow Mattress, saving a lot on a comfortable mattress with a lifetime comfort guarantee is easy. Why? Well, because we make our mattresses right at the store. Yeah, we cut out the middleman and voila, you got it. We pass the savings directly on to you every day. So hurry in today to your local Verlo, where there are no middleman markups. Wake up, sleep better, and save at Verlo. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joe and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Time for garden questions and answers. You've got a question, or you can send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call. On our hotline, toll-free, coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. This question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. When is the best time to transplant my cucumbers from my seed tray? Well, first of all, it's best is cucumbers and, and that family of uh, seeds is best to be directly sown when the soil temperature is at root zone, which is about an inch to two inches deep, of 65 degrees or above. If the temperature is below 50 degrees, the seeds won't germinate. But since you've already started them indoors, if you properly harden them off, then you can take them out when the chances of all frost are over and you can plant them at that point. You wanna harden them off again correctly. And then once the soil temperature exceeds at 65 degrees and above at root zone, you can go ahead and uh, plant them. But if you take a transplant and you put it in the ground and next to it you put a seed in the ground, in about four weeks they're both going to be about the same size. So by direct sowing these plants, you can greatly uh, reduce the amount of area in your grow room or your home in which you need to have space to start these seeds. So keep that in mind. All right. So our next question, let's go to Gary, who is listening to us on WPIC 790 in, uh, what is it, Sharon, Pennsylvania. And he's got a question, and let's see what we can do for him. Yeah, hi. uh, This is Gary in West Middlesex, Pennsylvania. I just had a question. I'm trying to um, recede uh, a small section of uh, a property that on land that was uh, dug up and uh, with grass seed and with all the temperature difference, hot, cold, really hot, hot, and then getting cold and cold again. What's a, should I wait until it's like the temperatures have uh, you know gotten more uh, seasonal and, and regulated to put the grass seed down? Because I put some down earlier and it didn't seem like it sprouted. So maybe it was because it got it made me too cold again. And it, and it got all that rain, too, something got washed down away. Okay, thanks. All right, Holly, can we help him out here? Yeah, we can. So you can essentially put grass seed down any time, but it is best to do it in the late summer and then all through the fall because it, it wants to grow in those cooler temperatures. Yeah. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you can, uh, based on where you're at in the state, he is in the southern portions of the state. Uh, they do have grass seed of uh, Zyas, Z-Y-O-Y-S-I-A, which is a warm season grass, which you can plant now. But uh, typically, most of the grasses you would grow in Pennsylvania are 
cool season grasses and um, K- Kentucky bluegrass, fescue, uh, that type of thing. So you can grow it any time. Again, if it's been cold and then hot and then cold, you're going to have problems getting that germination to occur. So certainly wait until the season. If you do want to get that spot filled in as quick as possible, you can either seed it as soon as the so- uh, temperature and the soil warms up, or you can actually, if you have a small area, you could drop sod in there as well. So hopefully that helps you out, Gary. Thank you for giving us a call. If you want to be like Larry, you can send us uh, you can jam your fingers in the phone and give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. All right, Holly, what is the difference between potting mix and soil starting mix? Well, um, so the internet answer is that seed starting mix provides the ideal environment for germinating seeds, but isn't designed to feed the seedlings long term. So basically, seed starting mix is good to get those little guys going, but not long term. Potting soil is I- uh, ideal for over several weeks of growth um, or months at a time, but isn't ideal for planting seeds. Now, because it has a slow release fertilizer. Now for us, we've started seeds in both and had success just fine so it's really up to you it's kind of your mileage may vary type of situation i personally as somebody who likes efficiency would not purchase seed starting mix and then potting soil i would just purchase one or the other right get something with that slow release in it that's what we use and it feeds our plants from the time we put them in the seed starting tray or start them till we take them outside so um you can uh you're potting and something whatever it is have a slow release fertilizer because yes there is nutrients in that potting soil most times but if you have that slow release fertilizer that's going to help supplement some of that energy that that plant needs so you don't have to supplement it yourself well here's a question for you joy because it's your favorite thing to do okay what's that um (laughs) I mean, you do like doing it, I think. Maybe. I'm not really sure. Probably you're the more responsible one in this case. Can you explain hardening of plants and how to do it? Do I do it for all my plants? What's up with that? Okay. So as we talked about a few moments ago, by planting or direct sowing as many of your warm weather crops as possible, you don't have to harden them off. Hardening off plants is a procedure in which you take the plants from your indoor climate-controlled environment or greenhouse and gradually get them acclimated to the outdoor temperatures, the intense sunlight, as well as the temperature itself, the ambient temperature inside, 70, 60 to 70 degrees, and greenhouse can be up to 80 degrees. For your onions, your leeks, your pepper, or your, uh, your any of your plants, your cool weather crops, you still have to get them acclimated. You just can't take them from 70 degrees, plant them in the ground, and expect them that the soil is 38 to 45 degrees and it's going to do fine. They're going to go in a shock. So by getting them acclimated, you are getting them used to being outside. So in order to do this correctly, you want to start the first day, take them outside, but put them in a shaded area. Then the second, and for, for as long as you can... Uh, A cloudy week is ideal for this because even though it's cloudy, there is a certain amount of rays of sunlight coming in, but it's not as intense.